Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Welsh. I'm uh, head of the process integration team here at Malachite Technologies and I'm one of the co-founders. And today I'd like to um, share with you some work we've um, been developing on a ribbon, ribbon ion beam for anti-reflective glass surface modifications. Let me start with a brief overview of our company. So we're located here in San Francisco, California. Um, most of our engineering staff comes out of the uh, thin film coating and plasma processing world. So we have quite a bit of expertise in that field. Uh, we do a lot with process integration and hardware integration on various projects. And our, our lab and facilities are set up here to support material science related application development um, on many fronts. So the pictures on the right here show some of our capabilities. We have a couple of confocal PVD uh, deposition and plasma processing systems. We have a horizontal inline system and we also do quite a bit with microwaves. Uh, we I gave a talk earlier this week on high density microwave plasmas and some process applications around that. And we're also developing uh, microwave assisted uh, chemistry reactors. So the bottom right picture there shows a, a high pressure, high temperature reactor that we built recently for uh, a national lab out east. But so we have a, a couple of uh, in-house development programs underway, um, but we also do quite a bit of engineering service. So um, we. Uh, customers or other potential collaborators need some help, um, we can step in with our expertise and um, help drive projects forward quickly and efficiently. So let me get into it. So um, the ion beam source that we've been developing is a, it's a ribbon ion beam. And the, one of the key features of it is that it is uh, scalable to any arbitrary length. There's no real, there's really no intrinsic limit to how long the source could be. Uh, it, is able to deliver up to an amp per linear meter of ion current, and that uh, correlates to a current density of up to 30 milliamps per square centimeter. It has a single slit electrode architecture and produces a neutral beam, which can be controlled to a divergence of less than two degrees. And um, importantly, the ion energy of this beam can be controlled all the way down to 100 EV and all the way up to and exceeding 60,000 EV. Um, we have sources that operate in that full range and are currently developing applications around um, those ion energies. Um, this talk in particular will focus on the high end, but I'll, I'll give an overview of, of all of the work briefly here. Um, the pictures on the right show uh, the source in operation. You can see this upper left. We have the red color here is the high voltage isolation bushing, um, which allows it to be flange mounted. And you can see this is a 200 millimeter long source um, and configured as such. Uh, you have the, uh, this nice sheet of plasma extending out along its full length. You can see uh, a nice uniform color there indicating good uniformity of that beam output. And then if we look at the top view, uh, I give you an example of this very narrow divergence that we can control to. So this slit here, this is the beam from the top. I have a viewport there at the top of the chamber. And you can just see how well controlled that beam is all the way through. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So when I look at the design of the source, it has um, a couple of key features. So there's a simple filament used to provide electron generation through thermionic emission. Uh, there's a three electrode configuration. So we have an ion extraction electrode, a suppression electrode, and a grounded electrode. And those three electrodes allow us to create a neutral beam. Um, it has a single slit architecture, which allows for these high ion currents and because of that, it's a simplified construction. So I think the, the single set architecture has a couple of features. One, you know, the high ion current, like I mentioned, uh, the simplified alignment, uh, and it really helps to uh, contain the costs on a source like this. So it's a, a key feature for the design of this, uh, of this ion beam. And finally, uh, the magnetic and plasma confinement. So this is really what allows it to go to any arbitrary beam length. And if you look at this uh, schematic I have here on the right, there's a cross section of the source uh, you can see this coil in the center here is filament, so that's where the electrons are generated. And then it's it's being it's placed in the null of this quasi quadrupole um, magnetic confinement. And you normally, under normal circumstances, any electron that's generated from the filament would want to be attracted to the anode, which is pointed out here by these two circles. These are these are rods that run the length of the source. But because of the way this is designed, the rods, these anode rods, sit within. Uh, this magnetic field. So the electrons that are generated can't cross these magnetic, magnetic lines, of course. And so they have a long circuitous path to before they're recombined. And that's what this 
image on the bottom right here, it's actually a modeled electron path. So you can see there's lots and lots of um, uh, interactions, I should say, with the argon that's present in this source. So you get lots of ionization, lots of collisions. And ultimately this electron, even though it's generated on one end with the filament, is able to tra traverse up and down the source. And it's really a key feature for us to get good uniformity along a full length and really extend the length of the source, um, like I said, to any arbitrary length. So revisit some of these pictures and the, the control over the beam shape. So on the left here is the source with some of the electrodes removed, but it gives you a good snapshot into um, the single slot architecture that we have. You can see this running the length of the source. Um, and then when we turn it on and depending on the voltages and the pressure that we're operating at, we can control this beam shape. So here, this first image, it's a 12 inch source of substrate distance, but you see, I maintain this nice, you know, very sharp, came all the way through from the source to the substrate. Um, it would deliver a lot of energy in this single point. Um, but I can recognize that not all applications would require that. And so we can actually, we can tune this. So I can see in these subsequent photos here, I'm starting to um, expand out the divergence a little bit here. I still have a fairly nicely collimated beam, but it opens up, I think it's about an inch to an inch and a half wide at this throw. And then I can go for, this is kind of the expansion um, maximum we can see it's, following the shape of um, chamfer and the grids here. Um, but this would be you know, spreading out the energy a little bit. And depending on the application and what your specific um, goal is, um, you know, this might be more appropriate. But it really you know, defines, you know, this is, gives the ribbon beam its name, right? You have this very sharp interface. It allows us to be very precise with the control of this beam. If I look at the beam properties itself, uh, on the left here, I have what uh, the ion energy that was taken from a Faraday cup. So each one of these colored peaks is a different um, process setting for the source. And you can see that we get these very narrow outputs. So not only is my beam shape controlled, but the beam energy is also very well controlled. So it, in particular, this, this peak here at the end, the blue one is, I believe that's 113 volts. So when you're thinking of things like DLC, um, where DLC typically requires a very precise level of ionization and energy that's reaching the substrate to form the bonds that you want. This, I think, um, demonstrates the, the control over that. Um, and then on the right here, I start to look a little bit at the uniformity along the length of the beam. So this is the full length is eight inches or 200 millimeters, which is the source that I showed previously. Um, and then I'm looking at the etch rate on a Thermox wafer. So this is an easy test for us. I'm able to pass a wafer past, you know, um, transfer the, the wafer past the source and then measure the resulting film thickness. And I get an etch rate and get a uniformity from that. So you can see there's a little bit of fall off at the edge um, in that first inch or so, but then it, quite, it gets to be quite flat. And it, in this iteration, I'm at about plus minus 7%, which is good enough for most of our applications, um, but we're actively working to improve that further. This, this can be adjusted by the, the gas flow into the, the source body. And so we're looking at um, making improvements to the, the gas distribution and control there so that we can tune out this little bit of deviation that we have here at the edge. So, you know, that kind of gives an overview of the source itself, obviously. So there's a wide process window here. Um, I can have an ion beam that's very well controlled at high ion currents, and I can expand a wide energy range. So down at 100 to 300 EV, that can really support ion assisted processes, um, ion, -ass ion assisted deposition of things like thin silver for low E windows, um, hydrogenated, I'm sorry, non hydrogenated DLC films, low temperature TCOs, and do things like surface activation. Um, again, it's, it's meant to be large area um, linear sources that um, will help improve substrates down in, in that energy range. Um, if we go beyond that, um, and up to about 10,000 volts is when you start to get into ion milling and ion etching. So we've done this for large format substrates. We've done this for cutting tools. Uh, and we've also attempted and looked at things like a linear ion beam sputter deposition. So instead of pointing the beam at a substrate, you can point it at a sputter target and induce a coating deposition by that technique. And then beyond that, we start to get into ion implant, right? And so you can look at the trim and trim tables to figure out um, what's, what the beam is capable of, but um, in particular, I'm gonna be talking about uh, ion implant for anti-reflection treatments, but there's other things like surface nitriding, surface hardening, um, and other things that we're looking at, but how, you know, how, how to take advantage of an ion implant source on a linear scale.
And again, the point is really that we have a linear configuration, we have high ion currents, and we can span a wide energy range. So there's lots of application potential here. When I do look at ion implant, um, uh, the, the nice thing is that there's a lot of history, a lot of literature out there. Um, ion implant has been studied in numerous ways, numerous applications, but in, in one particular instance, it's been proven to show that it can induce uh, an anti-reflection effect, anti effect into glass substrates. And um, the, the caveat of that has been that the sources have always been limited uh, in their size and their scale, so that it never was quite appropriate for industrial glass coating, uh, solar display, automotive industries. And we feel like we've solved that. We feel like with this source, with the high ion currents and its scalability, we can start to um, use these ion implant techniques on the large industrial scale. And um, I'll, I'll show here a little bit. So the data I've taken here is uh, looking at the argon dose and how it affects reflected. So you can imagine, so there's the voltage of the beam itself, which in this case was done at 50,000 volts, which determines the penetration into the substrate. So you can imagine that that's kind of defining the thickness of the treatment. Um, and then the dose itself or the current determines how much the substrate changes in response to this beam. So the technique is that the argon is implanted into the glass surface and it's creating some more micro porosity. And that micro porosity is effectively changing the refractive index of the substrate. So I'll drive home the point that this is not a coating. This is not applied to the surface. This is, you know, we're modifying the, the interface of the glass substrate itself. So it's very durable, it's robust, and it's a graded index, which is a fairly forgiving optical film or optical treatment. So because of that, it becomes a very powerful tool for things that need to survive in outdoor environments and harsh environments like like I said, so solar top glass is a, a key metric here. Other types of architectural glass, um, I think can really benefit from this technique. And the data here shows, so I have a black line of an untreated sub substrate, which is, has about 4% reflection on a single side. And then as I increase my dose at 50,000 volts, you can see I start to induce this anti-reflection. And the green line here shows I'm almost completely eliminating the reflection down in the in the visible regime between 400 and 600 nanometers. So you can tune the optical properties and you know it basically creates this effect and makes it as robust and as durable as the glass itself. Uh, the bottom picture shows uh, an untreated sample on the left and a treated sample on the right. You can clearly see the, the change in reflectance there, just um, the macroscopic visualization of it. Um, I would also mention here briefly, so we've done this technique on glass that's been subjected afterwards to glass tempering temperatures and the effect remains. So when we're thinking about applications like automotive, you can imagine that you could have a flat plate of glass that's treated with this, this technique, and then the glass is subjected to the remaining um, tempering process where it's shaped into its final form. And so you can imagine a windscreen that has an anti-reflection treatment here. Now uh, here's an, a configuration of a, one of our systems. This is our inline system that we're configuring now for this implant, inline implant technique. And um, this shows the electrical cabinet, which is a self-contained unit. It has all the power supplies, the AC distribution, the uh, process gas manifold, uh, EtherCAT PLC controller. So we have a completely self-contained unit that's powering the source itself. And, and in this in exact configuration, I actually have this trapezoidal chamber lid, which allows me to do an ion beam on one side and a linear sputter source on the other. So I'm doing this ion beam assist work. But this same platform will be used for both uh, true, just a, a simple implant down technique and also this ionated technique. Um, in terms of our status, we have both a 200 millimeter and a 350 millimeter source operational. We're working on a 500 millimeter source. And beyond that, that really starts to get beyond our capability here. We have a, our, you know, the inline I've, I showed in the previous uh, slides, uh, obviously it has a limit to how big it can be. And so while we think we can go longer than 500 millimeters, uh, at that point, we'll really need to look at a collaboration with um, some outside partners to, to engage and, and execute on, on a source design of that size. Um, but regardless, we'll use these smaller sources to continue to push the application space and demonstrate throughput um, and capability with the inline system. We're gonna look at additional things like surface hardening. So along with anti-reflection, you could do things like harden, you know, improve the, the scratch protection and the surface hardness of the glass, which obviously would be useful for things like displays. Um, and, and like I said, it's a wide process window. So we're always looking for new applications. We're always looking for customers who might see this technology and say, oh, wow, this would be really great for us. Um, so please contact me and let's chat about 
um, what you're working on and see if there's good overlap. So, okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Um, here's my contact info. Uh, please reach out if there's any additional questions or comments. And many thanks to the contributors here. Uh, Dr. White, who was the original inventor of the source, continues to push on and push and optimize the design. We have uh, Dr. Brown, who's working on the process today, uh, who's done a lot of great work. And uh, Robert Weiser, CEO, who's really led the uh, hardware integration teams to um, make all these sources function and integrate with our system. So thank you to the team and looking forward to more work. Um, I'll mention briefly also that this was funded by the NSF through a phase two SBIR award. So we're kind of in the um, waning months of that program, but uh, certainly appreciate their support over the, the last couple of years. Okay, thank you.